man church. Statistics tell us that only 39% of total worship attenders are men. Man Church is seeking to challenge and change the affections of a man's heart. So many men are disconnected with faith and family. Man Church will present God's directives and influences in a way that men can relate to, man to man and face to face. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the end that I'm breathing. I have a future. Just thank you for calling our name tonight. Yeah. I was just sitting there. Where, where did he go? Where's Zach? Zach's been here, what, uh, about five or six years, something like that. And just as green as he could be when he first got here. And, and uh, God has just done a tremendous work in him. And, and what a tremendous talent and voice. Uh, leads the music here every uh, Sunday morning uh, in the lift. And uh, then Brad, uh, praise God, where where in the world has that talent been? And I'm so grateful that uh, this group had the privilege and opportunity to hear your first presentation of the gospel in song. And uh, uh, amen, amen. Yeah. Um, I suspect I will remember this till the day that I die. And uh, what a great testimony. Uh, in song. Well, the building itself, don't you love the new facility? And the sound is just uh, amazing. It's not bouncing off the walls and there's that, no reverberation going on. And so uh, they've, they've done a good job putting this thing together. And uh, I love um, just the, the, the facility itself that God has blessed us with through you. It was through your generosity, through your giving. Uh, that uh, the Lord brought this to become a reality. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. So it, it's been a desire of ours for a very, very long time. And that desire has come to fruition. You know, you got to really be careful what you wish for. You know, I just got back from uh, uh, Myrtle Beach. I went down late Wednesday evening, played in a golf tournament down there yesterday. And... Uh, Drove back uh, this morning, and uh, you, you, you run an old boy down there on the beach, and he was walking down the beach, and he found uh, a bottle, and he picked that bottle up, and as soon as he kind of just rubbed the, the uh, sand off of it, up pops a genie, and, and the genie told him, said, sir, you know, um, I, I am the genie of the bottle, and it is my uh, pleasure and privilege to grant you uh, any three wishes that you would like to make. And so, uh, what is your bidding? And he said, well, and the genie interrupted him, said, no, wait a minute, before you get started, I need to tell you that 
whatever you wish for, I'm going to give your mother-in-law twice what you wish for. Two times whatever you wish for, I'm going to give your mother-in-law. And so she said to him, is that acceptable? And he said, well, yeah, I'd be all right with that. So she said, what's your first wish? And he said, well, uh, I'd like to have a million dollars. Gave him a million dollars. And she said, I just want you to know now your mother-in-law has two million dollars. What's your second wish? He said, you know, I've always wanted one of those bright, shiny, gray, new Rolls Royce. I want a Rolls Royce. Poof, Rolls Royce. She said, I just want you to know, your mother-in-law's got two of them now. She said, now you need to really be careful what you wish for uh, in your third wish. This is your final wish. He said, now what, what can I grant you this third and final wish? And he thought for a minute and he thought and he thought and he, he, he said, I, I think I know what it is. And she said, well, well what's your third wish? He said, I want somebody to beat me half to death. <laughs> it's pretty bad, isn't it? You got to be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, the, the most difficult part um, that I face, and I, I don't know about other preachers, don't know about other speakers, but the most difficult thing that I have to uh, decide is the passage of scripture. When I get ready to preach or speak, God, what scripture passage do you want me to do? And, and, and frankly, guys, um, this evening has been one of the most difficult times that I've had uh, determining what, what it is God wanted me to speak to the men about tonight. But I'm, I'm standing here to tell you, after wrestling with the Lord, after um, trying my best to prostrate myself before him and listen. I, I am convinced that I am where I need to be. I'm going to be more different probably tonight than you've ever heard me. And, and I, I don't know that I've ever shared this in the context of a men's meeting or not. Uh, and, but I, I can tell you unequivocally, I know that God has spoken to me and I don't know why. Uh, I don't know who needs this. Um, only God does. I've only done this a couple of other times, uh, and that is share my testimony. I remember the first time was just a few years ago. Uh, I was on my way to North Greenville University. I had my sermon. I had the notes. Uh, I got there a little bit early, which is a miracle in and of itself. And I was sitting out in the parking lot, and I was going over my notes, and the Holy Ghost said, I don't want you to preach that. And I said, well, wait a minute, God. I mean, I've got 15 minutes here. God said, I don't want you to do that. I want you to give your testimony. I said, but God, I have never told anybody about my life. And God said, I know, but I want you to begin today. And, and I just wrestled with the Lord, but it was really apparent that that's what the Holy Ghost wanted. So I went inside and I'm telling you, I was a nervous wreck. And uh, it was my time to speak, and all of a sudden, the, the, the Holy Ghost anointing just fell on me. And I shared my life story uh, with seven to 800 university students. When I finished, 36 students walked down the aisle that day, including the quarterback on the football team and many of the cheerleaders, and gave their life to Jesus and it began a revival on that campus that is still going on many years later. Tonight I came, uh, we gotta get it most. I came with the same unction that I had that day. Now it may not flow, it may not, and, and I may, something may hit my mind in the middle of a, and, and I may go off and chase a rabbit or two on the way, but I, I want you to hear my heart for a few minutes because, guys, I'm going to tell you something. If God can do in me and through me and with this guy, he can do it with anybody. 
I grew up in the western part of North Carolina over in the mountains, a little place called Cedar Mountain. My dad was a card-carrying, certified moonshine bootlegger. My grandfather before him, his daddy before him. It ran in our family. My grandfather had a sawmill where we lived and uh, they would run that liquor on those old log trucks up and down the road. Election time came, they would load up a ton truck with a bunch of pint jars and go all over the county and pick up every drunken derelict, carrying them to the voting polls to make sure that they voted for the sheriff that would not prosecute them by making that liquor. My mom and dad moved away from me twice by the time that I was 11 years old. Had no idea where I lived. Had to ask the neighbors, really, uh, where my mom and dad were and how I could rejoin them. It's not a good feeling. My dad was totally oblivious to anything going on in my life. Uh, my dad was a whoremonger. Uh, I lived in shame and degradation at the lifestyle of my dad. Um, my mom spent all of her energy and all of her time. And you know my mom, and, and uh, when you see her on Sunday, uh, you really need to thank God because there's no woman alive that I know of that had the level of commitment to a marriage like she did. And she devoted her life to keeping that home together. I remember um, at the 50th wedding anniversary, we had a big party for them in uh, Cedar Mountain. And uh, my mom and I were the last ones out of the house and everybody else had gone to the community center and uh, mom broke down and started crying. And I said, what's wrong with you? She said, I don't want to go. I said, what do you mean you don't want to go? I don't want to go. I said, mom, there's 75 people up there waiting on you to come. You, you've got to go. I don't want to go. She said, I feel like the biggest hypocrite in the world because you know what our marriage has been like and we're going to go up there and celebrate 50 years and you know what kind of lifestyle that it's been. I don't want to go and act like a hypocrite. I said, but mom, what you don't understand is this. The greatest lesson you could have ever given me is the lesson of commitment and what it means till death do us part. God used that and we went on to the thing. But my mom spent all of her time, all of her energies just trying to keep dad where he needed to be. Uh, I'm not going to get into any of the specifics about what created the shame, but just trust me. Uh, it was as degrading to our family as it could have been. I couldn't trust my dad with my girlfriends. I, I couldn't trust him uh, with, with anybody. It was an amazing adventure. We moved to South Carolina when I was 11 years old. Um, that was a bad move in a lot of respects. Dad got worse. And... Uh, by the time I was 12, he pointed his finger at my nose and said to me, uh, you're no longer my son. And, and I kept wondering, what, what was wrong with me? You, you moved away from me two times and left me with grandparents. Why did you do that? And why don't you spend time with me? Why? And I grew up alone. I, I, I spent... Uh, most of my adolescence and teenage years living in a house by myself. Guys, I washed my own clothes. I fixed my own meals. I got myself ready to go to school wondering what's wrong with me that my parents don't love me. Never, you talked about love, John. I never heard my dad say that he loved me uh, until I was about uh, 30 years old. Um, that feeling bled over into everything that I did. I, I wanted to prove to my parents that I was somebody. I wanted to prove to them that I was worthy of their attention. And so I, I, I excelled in academics. I excelled in sports. Uh, but not one time uh, in all those years did my parents ever come to any game that I played. I played on the state championship basketball team in 1966 as a point guard. My senior year, we only lost 
two games all year long. Not one time did they ever come. I broke all kinds of records in track, and uh, some of those records are still standing even today. <clears throat> and the reason they're standing today, they closed the school. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're still there. Not one time did they ever come to any track meet that I had. Again, what's wrong with me? Why don't you love me? Am I not good enough? I became president of my senior class. Um, I was the first one off the stage that day after we had received our diplomas. I had spoken at the graduation, got my diploma, first one off to walk down the aisle and I look across the gym that was packed with people and not one family member came to my graduation. Hadn't been for my coach. God only knows where I'd be today. When I was uh, 14, with that mindset, and by, by the way, I had my first full-time job when I was 14 years old. Back then in South Carolina, um, you, you could get your driver's license. I had my driver's license and full-time job when I was 14 years old. But when I was 14, a man from um, a local Pentecostal church came and uh, knocked on my door and, and said, uh, you know, you got some friends that go to our church and we just want you to know we care about you. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. Nobody ever has seemed to care anything about me. He said, we care about you and we'd like to invite you to come to our church. So I go to church there and show up and, and, and to be very honest with you, gut level honest with you, um, I went to that church for one reason and one reason only. And uh, that was for the social aspect and chasing the girls. But I listened to the sermons and I listened to the teaching and here's what they said to me. They said, Mike, uh, uh, in order for you to know that God has accepted you and received you, then you have to speak in tongues. And so every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, I would go to the altar and I would lay out on the altar and genuinely begging God to accept me. And I thought, you know, if I can just be good enough, and here's that performance mode again, if I can just be good enough, if I can just excel, if I can get rid of all of the bad stuff out of my life, then maybe God would accept me. Now, I went long enough and I listened hard enough that I could mimic the language. But I was too real. I wanted the real thing. I had never experienced the real thing. And so I'd go to those altars, service after service after service, and I would beg God for his approval, only to go home after every service, disappointed, hurt, discouraged, and oftentimes would cry myself to sleep in that empty shotgun mill village house, wondering what's wrong with me. My parents don't want me. My family doesn't want me. And God, it's pretty obvious. You don't want me either. Went a couple of years and uh, I had a little bit of talent to sing and so I sang with the uh, youth group in the church and then did some solos and when I was 15 years old, I sang before about 4,000 people at a Church of God camp meeting in a contest that was there in Malden, South Carolina. So I did everything I knew to do that was right. And still, no acceptance. Couldn't perform. Wasn't working. Problem came about when the pastor's wife ran off with a tenor in the quartet. The church fired the pastor because he couldn't keep his home together. And remember that guy that came by my house and knocked on my door and said, we care about you? He turned out to be a pedophile and had molested many of the boys in our group. He tried with me. 
Didn't get very far. Didn't understand a whole lot up then, but I figured this out. God, if that's the best you have, I don't need you. And so I turned my back on the church, dropped completely out. And then in a gym class that I was teaching for the coach one day, I looked up and I saw the sweetest looking girl in the tightest blue shorts that you could ever imagine. And I said, wow. So I started flirting with her in the hallway. She flirted back. And I fell in love with the only real Christian that I had ever known. But now here's what I did. I started performing for her acceptance. She had absolutely no idea what I was really like. She had no idea who she was dating or she would have never dated me. She had no idea who she married or she would have never married me. I was drinking very heavily, taking speed with the pills. My mouth uh, was like a sewer. I was not faithful to her in any shape, form, or fashion. But boy, did I perform because I wanted her. I got my goal. Got married on a three-day pass. Um, let me back up just a minute because in uh, 1969, I was drafted. Um, Headed to Vietnam three weeks before I was to leave to go to Vietnam. My orders were changed. Um, that's a miracle of God. I'm just telling you. Um, I had had double pneumonia in November. I was in uh, NCO school. Uh, I thought if I'm going to Vietnam, I'm going to make me some money while I'm over there. And so I want the highest rank that I can achieve. I made E5 in nine months. On my way. Double pneumonia set in while I was in the school. I was in OJT waiting on to be shipped overseas. Phone rang. It was the doctor at the hospital. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sitting at my desk. And he said, you drop whatever you're doing and you get to the hospital immediately. He threw up an x-ray that had been, now mind you, this is in uh, January. Uh, I had had the x-ray done in November. How it showed up. Uh, three months later is just an act of God. And he threw that, back then he threw the x-ray up on the fluoroscope and he said, how did you get into the military? I said, I was drafted. He said, did they not do uh, an exam on you? I said, yep, just like everybody else. Uh, drop your pants and turn around and that was about the size of that deal. And he said, look at your x-ray. He said, your spine looks like a pretzel. He thought for a minute, seemed like an hour. He said, we got too much money tied up in you now to let you go home. And so ultimately, they, in about two months, they sent me to Fort Hood, Texas. In the interim period, I went home on a three-day pass, and my wife and I got married. We loaded everything that we had into a 62 Buick Special with a one-wheel trailer pulled behind it and took off to Colleen, Texas. Didn't know where we were going to stay. Had no idea what was waiting on us. We found a little mobile home and uh, didn't have any air conditioning. God help us in the center of Texas in a mobile home with no air conditioning in the middle of the summer. About three weeks after we were there, my wife said, I want to go to church. I said, that sounds good to me. I, whatever you want, honey. I, I, I want to please you. I love you and I don't ever want to lose you. So we went to church. For whatever reason, I invited the preacher to our house. Now, my wife was a horrible cook. She was an only child, grew up in a home, didn't know what home cooking was. They would open up a can of Lux beans and put it on the table and that was about it. And I remember the first pinto bean that she ever put in a pot I promise you, with a slingshot, we could have killed a bunch of Goliaths. <laughs> and why I invited that preacher to my house, I have no idea. Did something strange as I look back on it. He came to my house, sat at our table, 
Don't think he ate very much. But he never one time asked me about my relationship with God. He left. The next Sunday, I don't know what he preached on. Don't know what the music was like. I was sitting on the back row of that church and I heard the voice of God for the first time in my life. And I want you to listen because he knew how to get my attention. Here's what he said. You say, you, you, God spoke to you? Absolutely. Louder than words. And he said, I love you just like you are. Which conveyed to me, you don't have to work for my approval. You don't have to perform for my love. I love you just like you are. Guys, I promise you, it crushed me. Crushed me. Water started pouring out of my eyes. I couldn't wait for the invitation to get there. And as soon as it started, uh, I hit the aisle. And guys, I'm telling you, I was saved long before I ever got down to the front of that church. My life's never been the same since. Never gotten over it. I lost two-thirds of my vocabulary that day. My taste in beverage drastically changed. I, I'll never forget, I, I'm, I'm going to confess this to you. I don't know if I've ever confessed this or not, but uh, about six months after uh, I got saved, I was coming back from Austin, Texas with a new car that I just bought, stopped and got, uh, uh, got dinner, and I ordered a beer. And, well, I did have no idea but I took one sip of that beer and it made me so sick I thought I'd die. And I've never had alcohol ever again. And it, it, it's, it's just simply amazed me that God took all of that stuff uh, away from me. Now there was a lot of things that came much later, but there were certain things that immediately were gone out of my life and I've never been the same since. I got out of the military in March of 1971 and the last place that we wanted to go was back to Kathy's little hometown and her little home church. So we went back to Cedar Mountain where I left. I went back to my old job in the paper mill in Brevard. Uh, I worked one night, turned my notice in the next. I knew that wasn't for me. And, and knew it wasn't where God wanted me to be. So we moved back to that little hometown where I graduated high school. Tried to go other places to church, couldn't do it. Wound up right back at Kathy's little home church. Right after that, they asked me to be the minister of music. I knew nothing about music. But I said yes. And uh, God gloriously used us in a, in a mighty way. We had, we had 36 people in the choir uh, almost immediately. And uh, there might have been 10 people in the congregation, but we had 36 in the choir. And uh, it, it, was, it was an incredible ministry opportunity. Uh, in 1973, um, I was working at Sears in Greenville, South Carolina as a carpet salesman. There was a men's room. Uh, now, this is going to be a little far-fetched to some of you, but you know what? It, it happened. There was a men's room right beside the, the department that I served, and that men's room became a sanctuary for me. It became the place where God dealt with me on a regular basis. I was in that men's room one day and the uh, Holy Spirit said, you're doing a good job. And that progressed over a period of a few months. You're doing a good job, but I have something else for you. That progressed. You're doing a good job I have something else for you. I want you to preach. In November of that year, I was leading um, an invitational hymn on a Thursday night. Um, the evangelist had come in and uh, was preaching up a storm, and, and I, I was leading that invitational hymn, and all of a sudden, the thought hit my head. You know, God, if Mike McCombs will come down the aisle tonight, uh, I'll surrender. Now, I never ran from the Lord. I, I just wanted to be sure. I, I never ran. I would have done anything for Christ. 
but, but I wanted to make sure. So right out of the clear, had no idea that God was dealing with Mike McCombs. Had no idea what was going on in his life. But I just said, God, if this is really you and you really want me to preach, I want Mike McCombs to come down and do the same thing. We didn't get through with a stanza until Mike left his place and started down that aisle. I didn't wait to find out why he was coming. I just shut my songbook up. I went to the preacher. By the way, here's something dumb. I don't recommend this at all. This is dumb. I had never spoken to my wife about my call and what was going on. That was just dumb on my part. But you have to understand, uh, I was not the man that I should have been. I was not the husband that I should have been. Not the Christian because I, nobody had ever mentored me. Nobody, I, I certainly didn't have a daddy as a role model. I, I had nothing to go by. So anyway, um, I went down, told the preacher what was going on. And uh, he took me back to his study. And uh, I shared with him what that whole story I just told you. So they sent for my wife. The preacher said, Mike's been called to preach. And she said, first words out of her mouth were, were how are we going to live? <laughs> Because we were accustomed to churches that said, God, uh, you keep them humble and we'll keep them poor. That's what we were accustomed to. I went in the next day. The next day. Now, let's just tell you how spiritually immature and impulsive that I was. I went in the next day and quit my job. Uh, they, they saw through a lot of that and convinced me to stay on part time. And so I went to school and worked part-time at Sears 30 hours a week and uh, pastored a church for eight years. Now that'll brain dead you guys, let me just tell you. Uh, in 1983, I received a call to come to First Baptist Indian Trail. I came here kicking and screaming. The only thing that was here was the Sossaman Chapel in the basement. That was it. Uh, they had red carpet and orange pew cushions. You could spit on the ceiling, it was so low. The gravel parking lot was uh, loaded with great, big, huge oak trees. There was no parking, but they had a cemetery. About two or three acres of land was all we had. And I was in a very modern contemporary building on a six lane highway in Greer, South Carolina on Highway 29. We had doubled in four years that I was there. And I told my wife, I said, honey, don't worry about it. We're not going to Indian Trail. Um, told my parents, we're not going. To, told her parents, we're not going to Indian Trail. I was on my way to Sears one morning and I passed a billboard. Strange the things that God will use to speak to you. God ever spoken to you through some strange means? The billboard said there is no heavier burden than a great opportunity. And I knew exactly who sent that message. Finally agreed to come. That, that's another story I wish I had time to tell you. I don't. Um, I agreed to come. And, and you see what God's done in the 35 years. That's my testimony. May I say to you tonight, you have a testimony. Can I get a witness? Amen. You have a testimony. If you've been saved by the grace of God, if God has changed your life, if he saved your soul, you have a testimony. Tonight I've, I've come to share with you for just a minute a man and his testimony. Now what you do with that testimony is another issue. You have one. What you do with it is an issue. Uh, I, I want to I talk to you about what to do with your testimony how to be effective for Christ. Um, let me give you five or six things and then we'll go home, okay? I'm trying to be brief as I can. You want your life to be, a, 
Let me, let me back up just a minute because it, it, this is, I, I think, pertinent. It, it's not in my notes, not what I intended to say, but it just occurred to me uh, for this to be effective, I need to tell you. Um, I was leading the music in that little country church one Sunday, and I looked up, and uh, at the very back row was my best friend. He'd never been to church. He just got back from Vietnam, had just married. I, I knew that he was not in church anywhere. And uh, he shows up at my church. Sat back there through the invitational hymn and left and went home. And he called me up a day or two later and he said, Mike, would you come by my house? Uh, maybe tonight, and I said, absolutely. And I knew what he wanted. I told Kathy after dinner, I said, honey, I, I gotta go see John, and uh, I won't be gone long. And I got to the car, and I said, you know what, I better take my Bible. And so I got my great big old Bible that I'd had, and I put it on the seat beside me, and I drove over to his house. And uh, I started to get out of the car, and I said, you know what, it'd be dumb for me to carry that Bible if that's not what he wants. So I, I left the Bible in the seat of my car, rang the doorbell. He's six foot three. He was the center on the team uh, that I played. And he came to the door and he looked down at me and he said, you know what I want, don't you? That was exactly what he said. You know what I want, don't you? I looked back and I said, be right back. And I went to the car, got my Bible, and the first person I ever led to Jesus was my best friend. It lit a fire in me that's never waned, never died. I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I want to talk about Jesus. Can, can I talk to the RA boys? And he said, absolutely. So I talked to the RA boys and gave them my testimony and asked them to be saved. And eight RA boys got saved. We baptized eight boys. I, I said, Pastor, can I talk to the GAs? And he said, yeah, you can talk to the GAs. So we had a GA meeting. I talked to those girls. Five of them gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Thirteen got saved. And John got baptized with those 13. I found out real quick, God could use my testimony. He can use your testimony. How? Number one, hope you'll write it down. You ready? Number one, we have to want people to be saved. You got to want people to be saved. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 20 and uh, verse 24, Paul is saying his farewell uh, to the church here. And uh, here's what he said in verse 24. Acts chapter 20. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry uh, which I have received of the Lord. Now I get this one. To testify the gospel of the grace of God. I, I, I want to finish my life, Paul says, telling people about God's grace and his mercy. Paul had an amazing, amazing desire, wanting people to be saved. The ninth chapter of Romans in that first verse, uh, wonderful verse. Listen to this. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Do you know what Paul just simply said? He simply said, God, if me forfeiting my salvation could get somebody saved, I'm willing to do that. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know that I've ever been there. I don't know that I've ever had that kind of desire. I don't know that I could honestly stand here as your pastor today and tell you that, that I would do the same thing, that I'd give up my salvation. I'd die and go to hell 
if it meant somebody else to go to heaven. But Paul said, I have such a burning desire. God, just write me out of your Lamb's book of life if it means that somebody else could get into heaven. Wow. You got to want people to be saved. How many of you, I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want where's your, to, where's your quotient when it comes to wanting people to, to be saved? Do you really want people to know Christ? Do you really want people not to spend eternity in hell? Well, if God's ever going to use your testimony, you've got to want people to be saved. Number two, you've got to go find them. You've got to go find them. Uh, the Gospel of John Go to that first chapter, John chapter 1, and I want you to see verse 40. John chapter 1 and uh, verse number 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Look at verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. Andrew gave his heart and life to Jesus, was gloriously saved by the grace of God. And the Bible says that the first thing that he did after he got saved is that he went to his brother and said, man, you need what I got. You need to come and know the one that I know. It's the Messiah. You need to know Jesus. So you see, see, he went and found him. I, one of my favorite and mind-boggling stories in all of the Bible is when Jesus said, I must first needs go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with a whore. She was sexually promiscuous to the point she slept with about every man in town. He gets there to the well, and he says to her, um, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. Well, you got that right. You've had five of them. And the dude you're living with now is not your husband. She was overwhelmed. Ran into the city. Told the whole city, come see a man that told me everything about me. He's changed my life. So, so you've got to want people to be saved, but then you've got to figure out where they are. You got to go find them. And she went to everybody in the town. And number three, you ready for this one? Here's where I'm afraid some of us, if we're not careful, we really drop the ball. Number three, we have to tell them. In, in John chapter 1, verse 41, in the latter part of verse 41, notice what he said. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said to him, and told him, we found the Messiah. I found Jesus. He's changed my life. You, you have to tell him. What do you have to tell him? You got to tell him what Jesus has done for you. I was having dinner the other night at a, at a wonderful restaurant in Charleston, South Carolina. I was there in a meeting and... Um, we, we went out to dinner. I can't even remember the name of the place, but it was an incredible, incredible, incredible place. And we had, had the sharpest waitress. I mean, she, she was an amazing person. And we had a little bit, didn't have a whole lot of time. Uh, and I don't remember her name right now, but I, I, let's say her, her name Mary, for lack of a better word. I, I looked at her, and, and, and here's... Here's just how one of the ways that I begin to tell people. This is just one of the little deals that I use uh, and have used it for two or three decades now. 
I looked up at Mary and I said, Mary, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you in your life? Caught her off guard, so kind of just staggered. She stammered around and, and, and couldn't figure out what to say. And I, 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 unbelievable. And she finally muttered out something. And, and then she went off to get something for another table or from us. And she came back and she said, you know, that, I don't know that anybody has ever asked me uh, such a question like that. She said, it's got me thinking like never before. So it's just an opener that God oftentimes uses. And they'll describe to you some silly little something that might have been the greatest thing that ever happened to them in their life. Now here's the deal. Here's what happens. Well, what's, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to you? <laughs> Boom! So, so you've got to ask them. You got to tell it. You, you can't just give them your testimony. You can't just share the gospel and back away. You've got to do the invitation. When is the last time you looked at some dude's eye and said to him, Bill, wouldn't you like to know Jesus as your Savior? When's the last time? Tom. Wouldn't you like to know Christ? Gary, wouldn't you like to know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? Guys, you've got you, you to gotta not only just throw out the net, you've got to attempt to draw that net in. One of the things that just absolutely drives me bananas is the lack of a gospel invitation in our churches across the land. A preacher will get up and give a good clarion call of the gospel, preach the Bible, have tremendous soul winning music, and stirs the hearts of the people. And when he comes to the end of the service, just simply says, hey guys, thank y'all for coming. God bless, you're dismissed. It's going on all over America. You won't find that model in the Word of God. Jesus was always telling people to come and follow Him. Guys, we got to get beyond this thing of, well, yeah, I just want people to see Jesus in me, and I want them to watch my walk. No! They have to be invited. When's the last time you told somebody about the Lord and said to them, hey, Sam... Andy, Bill, Tom, Luke. Don't you want to know Jesus? We have to tell them. I was playing golf uh, yesterday. Two complete strangers in, in, in that tournament. And uh, got to talk to them about the change. Just change. Yeah, they wanted, wanted uh, I, I don't remember how it came up, but I was able to say, you know what? I don't have to do that anymore. God changed my life when I was 20 years up. There's all kinds of opportunities uh, for you to tell. You, you understand something? Hear my heart a minute. If you don't hear anything else that I say, I want you to hear this statement. What Jesus has done for you carries more weight than anything else that you could possibly tell them. What he's done for you. Uh, number four, we need to ask them. We need to ask them. Look at John chapter 9. Got to tell the gospel. I may have gotten ahead of myself a little bit. I have a way of doing that. In John chapter 9 and verse 27. Here's what the Bible says. He answered them, I have told you already... And you didn't hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will, here, here's that invitation. Will you also be his disciples? <laughs> Don't you want to be saved? Now, here's this old boy. I'll set it up for you. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd been born blind. God, uh, God's son healed him. And the religious rulers cornered him and, and wanted to know, how did this happen? 
He says, I don't know how it happened. Well, who is this? I don't know who he is. All I know was once I was blind and now I see. Well, they came back at him again one day. He said, did you not understand me the first time? Am I going to have to tell you again? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Do you want to be his disciples too? You got to ask. You got to tell them what Jesus has done for you. And then you've got to ask them, do they want to be saved too? I, uh, I, I want to I reiterate something that I thought was so profound uh, Monday nights a week ago. We talked about this in the staff meeting uh, on Tuesday. And I, I was just sitting there um, when Dr. Steve Gaines was preaching on soul winning and telling other people about Jesus and, and, and how it's important for us to do it. And, and he said this, Mike, you, you probably heard him say it. He says, if God lays it on your heart to speak to somebody about Jesus, he's already prepared their heart to receive what you've got to say. Powerful, elementary, but powerful. But yet the enemy, what does he do? Well, they're going to slam the door in my face. What does he do? He's going to tell me to drop dead. No, 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 no. Don't you listen to that garbage. If God lays something on your heart that heavy, you know what? I, I used to be so afraid to talk to my daddy. Um, when I was... Uh, about 35 years old, pastoring here. Uh, we had a 24-hour prayer room underneath the Sossaman Chapel. And I went in there one day and uh, I, I released all of the bitterness. I released all of the anger that I had toward and the unforgiveness uh, that I'd had toward my dad that day. But my dad was a hard man. Fight. I've seen him, his head busted wide open. Somebody hit him in the back of the head with a tire iron. His guts were cut open with a knife. A, a guy cut him completely open. He had, had to hold his intestines in. He went to the hospital and, and he got sewed up at the hospital. Came back home that same night, found that fellow and beat the snot out of him. My dad was a hard man. Never told me that he'd ever loved me. Never told me. Didn't have anything to do with my life. I let all of that stuff go right up there. And, and I had this huge anxiety. I, I have no right trying to tell all these other people about Jesus. I have no right to, to go to these complete strangers and then go all over the world telling about Jesus when I haven't even talked to my family. I'm just in knots about it. We went up uh, one Friday or Saturday to visit from here back up at Cedar Mountain. And dad was a used car dealer by that time. And we got in one of his old pickup trucks. And I'll never forget uh, that day for the first time ever. I, I thought he, he's probably going to cuss me. And, and, and he's probably going to say he never wants to see me again or whatever. And I'll never forget when I talked to my dad about Jesus, how humble and how receptive that he really was. God had been preparing his heart. I ordained my daddy as a deacon when he was 80 years old. I baptized my mama when she was 75. God's good, guys. God's good. You got to tell him and you got to ask him. And if he's laid it on your heart to share it, their heart will be ready to receive it. And then one final thing. Uh, it's found in Acts 14. Um, let, let me just read it to you and then we'll close. Um, you can't just leave them after you've led them to Jesus. We still have a major responsibility to encourage and strengthen. In Acts chapter 14, 
and verse 21. Listen what the word says. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. In verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples, encouraging them and strengthening them and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You understand that after we find them and after we tell them and after we ask them and after they're saved, you still got to go and encourage those new believers. You can't just leave them out there all alone. Hadn't intended to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to take... Uh, just a minute now, we don't, we don't do much of this because I'm afraid of what you might ask. Anybody got a question you want to ask me about what you've heard tonight? Anybody anywhere? Okay, Brad. Yes, sir. Yeah. They were gone. Yeah. Then there were some things that remained. Yes. Um, yes. To be fully transparent, very similar to me. There's still some sin yeah. in my life. Um, and I want, I want to know what was in it. Okay. I, I believe it's got a purpose, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, here's the analogy that I use to, to get you a word picture of, of what I mean by that. Uh, in the fall, um, when the sap um, goes down in the trees, the leaves turn brown and they'll fall off. Have you noticed that in a lot of these oak trees, there's still some of those old brown leaves that never have a tendency to fall off and they're just there? And then the next spring, when that sap rises up in that tree, as these new leaves are formed, those old leaves are pushed off. Uh, as I grew in the Lord, as I submitted myself and surrendered to Him, and His Word became uh, a more important uh, facet of my life, as I began to walk with God more fully and got more of the Holy Ghost, and, that, and I, boy, that don't go run into, I got all of the Holy Ghost. When, when the Holy Ghost got more of me, that's a better way to put it. When the Holy Ghost got more of me, those old habits fell off. Smoking was a, Brad was a horrible, I loved Winston's, okay? God delivered me from alcohol. God delivered me from cursing. But I still held on to cigarettes. Knowing that, that I'll never forget I was leading the music one Sunday, and uh, uh, first thing that I did when I got out onto the church steps is I fired one up. And I'll never forget, this little boy about that high came up, and he looked up at me, and he said, mm, I didn't know deacons could smoke. <laughs> I felt about that high. And then one Easter, on the way to church, Kevin was about... Um, four years old. Andrew was about two. And uh, they had on their brand new Easter outfits. And Ke Ke Kevin had a, a leisure suit. And I burned a hole in that leisure suit, brand new on the way to church. I thought Kathy was going to kill me. On my way to preach my first sermon, I promised God. I prom my wife, Kathy, was all the time. She said, you can't pastor a church. You can't smoke and pastor. That was her. It, 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 the only fear that she had about going into ministry was that I would not be able to quit smoking. I promised God. I said, God, if I ever get a church, I will quit. Listen to this. On my way to preach my first sermon at my first church, I fired one up. I got within sight of that church. 
I littered, I threw that pack out the window, and I've never smoked another one since. I lost my voice for the next two weeks. The first six sermons after that, I had to ask somebody else to come and preach. I didn't have the voice for it. But God delivered me. Eleven years later, pastoring this church in a Volkswagen Beetle over there at that red light, I had the urge to smoke a cigarette, and God knows if I had got my hands on one, I'd have smoked it if it was that long. <laughs> but by the grace of God, see, the more you yield to him, the more you see those leaves, those dead leaves fall off your life. One more question. You know, Larry, Larry is, by the way, let me say a word about Larry. Larry, how old are you? 85. Larry's 85 years old. He's still serving God in full-time ministry at 85 years old with Wycliffe Bible Translators. Lives by faith now at 85 years old. He's in ministry. His whole calling is to get the gospel to the lost. That's his calling. Now what he's just said was, Pastor, um, does everybody go through seasons in their life when they don't even think about lost people? May, may I say to you, guys, one of the dangers of ministry is you get so wrapped up doing ministry you forget about looking for the people that are around you that God has sent you. So, Larry, I'm right there with you, buddy. And, and, and it's, it, it's just, it's really a, a hazard in ministry that you get wound up doing good things that you leave the best undone. And it just, it's a matter of prayer. It's a matter of determination. And, and I, I wish I had an, another time. I would, I would probably... Um, uh, go back to teaching. I did this probably uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, over in the um, JWAC when we had, the only gym we had was there is teaching us how to have a quiet time. Now guys, coming up, coming up very shortly, I'm going to be unpacking to the whole church. We're going to start with our leadership. We're going to start, we've already started with the staff We'll unpack it with the deacons. We'll unpack it with Sunday school leaders. And then we're going to unpack it to the whole church. And that is, we're going to develop some prayer, some guidelines for prayer for people that are lost. I want you to be praying. Even now, give, give, give our pastor wisdom and give our leadership wisdom uh, because we're going to be dealing with that very issue and how to overcome it is identifying people that are lost. And, 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 and so why don't we just start right now? I'm gonna give you a little bit of a head start. The other night, now I, I bragged on Steve Gaines' sermon um, in that one statement, but I sat there and I listened as he exposed a whole global approach. We gotta win everybody to Jesus. Look at me, look at me. You can't win everybody to Jesus. You can't win everybody to Jesus. But you can win one. And it ought to start with your family.
My grandsons right now are my target in my prayer life. I've got a 19-year-old grandson. I sat with him about two months ago. And I said, Cameron, Papa's got to know, have you truly been saved? Do you know Jesus? Where are you right now in your walk with God? Do you know that if you were to die, that you'd go to heaven? I love you, Cameron. Papa's got to know. Guys, we, 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 really need to, we really need to find out about our family. I'm going to ask you, it may not be a family member, but I'm going to ask you to identify one person. Why don't you write their name down on your sheet before we leave. John's going to come. He'll guide you through some of that. But I want you to think about who they are. And I want you to start praying that God will give you an opportunity to speak into the life of that one person. That's finding them. And then I want you to go tell them. And then I want you to ask them to come to Jesus. Okay, John? Um, I think you want to guide them in this, some of this process. Guys, I, I can't tell you, um, I, I don't know what tonight has meant to you, but I know this, I've been obedient to do what I know God led me to do. And you, you may found, I, I didn't tell you about getting put in jail. You don't need to know about that. <laughs> but can I tell one humorous story? Can, you got time for me to tell one? Let me, let, me tell you about the, let me tell you about God's providence a minute. I told you I got drafted in 1969. Did my basic training at Fort Bragg. I had just bought a 1969 Mach 1. My payments uh, were $112 a month. A private in the United States Army made $102 a month. You do the math. I went AWOL. Basic training. I went AWOL one weekend. Left as soon as we were through on Friday. I hit the road. I don't remember how I got home. I really don't. Um, I don't remember getting back either. But I, I don't remember getting home. And uh, had a wild weekend. I didn't even see Kathy. Had a wild weekend got my car, and somewhere right in here on Highway 74, I had a blue light behind me, pulled me over, took me to the Union County Jail and locked me up and uh, had to call a bail bondsman, uh, come get me out, and... Uh, had to be back in court on the day of record fire, which is the most important day of boot camp. I held on to that till just two or three days before. Tried every way in the world I could to get out of it. No way to get out of it. And um, so by the grace of God, my captain hooked me up with a drill sergeant who happened to take me to the Union County Courthouse and we were dressed in our uh, dress outfits and judge was letting everybody off. And I stood up, called my name, stood up. He said, you're guilty, aren't you, boy? I said, yes, sir, I am. Took my license away from me and charged me an enormous amount of money. Um, in 1983, pulpit committee called me and said, we're from First Baptist Indian Trail. I said, where is that? It's right outside of Monroe, North Carolina. I said, been there, done that, ain't going back. <laughs> Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor in his time. Okay, John. 